Hi, everybody. Yay. Thanks for joining us today. Hey. Um, I didn't do the usual thing that I keep going for 15 seconds before I let the guests know that we're live. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm very excited to have uh, Ash and Serena with me today. Uh, we're going to have um, a lot of interesting discussions. But before that, let's uh, get to know Ash. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Amir. Hello, everyone. My name is Ash Datsyuk. Uh, I'm a uh, lead for machine learning and blockchain group at uh, Aggregate Intellect. I've been with uh, these folks for quite a while since very 2018, I think. Uh, so I'm uh, so by training, I'm uh, uh, I have nothing to do with ML, to be honest with you. So I spend most of my career doing you know, marketing and sales for uh, uh, enterprise B2B. And uh, right now I'm a growth manager at a uh, fintech company. But uh, uh, that all together combined allowed me to got pretty get pretty deep uh, with machine learning, uh, which I started kind of working on full time in 2016. So I think at this point I have a pretty good understanding of what's happening in this world. and. I'd be happy to share what uh, I've learned personally and what we've learned uh, as a group uh, in uh, uh, aggregate intellect because we've we've done a few things. Yes, uh, it's great that you know what's happening in this world because I'm completely confused about what's happening in this world. Um, Same. What are you drinking? <laughs> what are you drinking, Ash, today? uh so it's 50 50 green tea and black tea hmm interesting mixture interesting. Hmm. i'm having tea. black tea and milk how about you serena i had and some coffee i hadn't had coffee until 11 30 a.m or maybe even 11 45 a.m so i just downed this so you're gonna see me becoming more and more caffeinated as this stream goes <laughs> on um and then i also just have some water <laughs> nice nice uh what's new with you serena not too much i'm traveling i'm in kentucky right now so having some fun in the us i've been working on my vegan app so food shake which lets you translate any recipe from non-vegan to vegan i'm starting to think about the release plan i might make a progressive web app we'll see yeah. um and yeah shameless plug if you're interested in learning about how to veganize any recipe and the technical details behind how i do that check out my um, Substack. It's foodshakeapp.substack.com. And you can follow me on social media, Friendly Veg on TikTok, Friendly Veg underscore um, on Instagram, and also FriendlyVeg.com. Nice, nice. But there that has go. nothing to do with what we're talking about today. Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you were considering, uh, you know, using blockchain in your app to give token to those who, you know, convert recipes and publish it. I am curious you know? about how I could yeah. yeah, actually use the blockchain, not just for hype, but for a real application <laughs> that makes sense. So yeah, I'm really curious to hear what Ash has to say. Yeah, we can talk about it, definitely. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of hype, uh, there's been a lot of hype around Web 3.0, blockchain, NFT. I literally open Twitter every, every day and everybody is like, oh my God, NFT, oh my God, Web 3.0. You know, investors, founders, everybody is completely obsessed with this. Uh, and, you know, a, a large part of it is obviously hype and people, you know, just getting excited about the next hot thing. But, you know, I've seen some interesting, speaking of real world, some interesting applications in real world. I mean, unfortunate, but, uh, you know, people using it to, to help the situation that is going on in Ukraine. Uh, and you're very closely related to that, Ash. Uh, what's what's happening there? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, so, so right now the situation is actually pretty dire. Uh, so we we I mean Ukrainian people were attacked from you know five different fronts, and uh, Russia's pushing uh, uh, pretty hard, but uh, our military force. Uh, uh, pushes back, uh, and uh, well, even me as a Ukrainian, I didn't expect uh, such a fierce resistance. Uh, but uh, we're doing pretty good, pretty good job on that front. Um, uh, 
it wouldn't be possible without the international support. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without people sending their crypto, without uh, people issuing NFTs and selling them, and you know, uh, sending those funds uh, uh, back into Ukraine. So there is a lot going on in the world. And uh, well, in Toronto, we started a fund called Second Front. Uh, so we started, you know, very simple, like collecting uh, defense supplies from people and sending them to Ukraine. So now we do it at scale. Uh, so we collect, uh, we find, collect uh, uh, bulletproof vests, helmets, stuff like that, uh, and send it to our defenders. Because uh, the only way for us to resist uh, the reign of tyranny uh, is to stand our ground and uh, uh, stand for our values. Uh, and that's what I'm inviting everyone to do because, uh, well, today it's Ukraine, tomorrow it can be any other country in the world. Uh, and we're fighting not for just our land, it's, it's uh, our freedom and uh, it's the freedom of uh, the rest of the world. Uh, so yeah, uh, as for uh, blockchain, it, it helped quite a lot, as I said, you know, uh, raising funds and uh, um, sending those funds to Ukraine, because you can imagine how hard it might be to uh, send something to a country where uh, military forces are just raiding the countryside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as somebody who grew up during an eight year war back in Iran, uh, I understand what's going on. And I'm very sorry that, you know, you have to deal with this, but unfortunately, there is so much to there's so much for me to understand about this world it just does not make sense some days you wake up and you're like what what is happening uh, but let's make sense of web 3.0 at least uh, <laughs> uh, so what's what's all that about uh, Serena you were saying your 2017 version of yourself you were <laughs> impressed by that a bit recently yeah, well, so I had written an article about Bitcoin in 2017 titled Bitcoin, what's the math? Because I had no idea what the math was behind Bitcoin. Um, and maybe we can talk about that a bit later because I, I wanted to ask Ash about Web3 because I had a friend, um, one of my friends, I like to talk to her about intellectual topics. And she said, Serena, you really need to get on Web3. And I was like, that's great. I know about Bitcoin. Um, from 2017, apparently a lot of things have changed. Um, yeah, Ash, can you yeah. give us like your TLDR of what Web3 is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, things has changed quite a lot, not even since, you know, 2009 when the, the Bitcoin emerged. But uh, uh, actually, I suggest we start with what Web 1.0 is, right? Because uh, we need to understand the progression. So uh, Web 1.0 is like an early internet where you can just uh, uh, use hyperlinks to access servers. So you don't have any means of interacting with a server. So it's basically just information out there. So that's 1.0. So 2.0 is the current stage where we can actually interact with the servers uh, and do a, quite a lot, uh, like what we do right now, for example. Um, so that's uh, web 2.0 and so the progression from there is basically um, um, so what happens in the web 2.0 you don't really own the data uh, in the web 2.0 internet so uh, whenever you send a tweet uh, this tweet is owned by the company uh, whenever you send a message it is on the company's servers so you don't have any means of kind of uh, uh, managing and, uh, you know, administrating your digital presence on the internet. So uh, there has been some changes since, you know, people started talking about privacy, security, and like digital ownership of their assets, of their dis digital assets. Uh, and well, the web point 3.0 is uh, like a logical, uh, progression from you know all those discussions and the way it is you know facilitated by blockchain is the following so uh, imagine that instead of uh, uh, 
having an entity in the real world, uh, you have uh, an automated system. Um, we call it smart contracts, and we'll talk about what that is a little bit later. But uh, uh, the gist of it is that all the rules of how to interact with you as a customer are written in that digital contract, right? So now nobody becomes an owner of that contract. So it just sits there and uh, provides you with some different services, right? And uh, uh, so nobody then owns the data that comes out of that smart contract and all the data is public. So the, the good thing about blockchain is also anonymized. Uh, so that's how you can think about Web 3.0. It's kind of a progression from the point where we are right now with you know, big uh, tech companies owning our data uh, into the world where we own our digital presence, our digital assets, and uh, uh, we, can, we, we keep control over that. So I hope that gives you know, some insight into what's happening here. Okay, so if I if I regurgitate what you said in as few words as possible, is it fair to say Web 1.0 was like from a user experience point of view, Web 1.0 was more about consumption. There were stuff and then I was just consuming it. Web 2.0, which is what we're experiencing currently is mostly is all about sort of centralized platforms. You know, there is an entity that is governing interactions between you as a user and some central platform, but you have agency, you can do stuff. Yeah. You cannot determine how your presence is handled, but you, there are knobs that you can turn. Uh, I like and, how you mix in the ML words such as agency into the <laughs> blockchain topic. There you yeah, go. sorry for interrupting. Uh, that, that that's more of a reinforcement learning i would say but anyway regardless so <laughs> uh and web 3.0 is still the same platform play except that there is less of a central centralized governance like there's a transparent um set of contracts that can be coded and that just governs all the interactions including your digital presence and the reason that this progression is happening is, you know, obviously people are not very happy with centralized governance in general. Uh, so a, a more decentralized system is just more secure, more uh, private, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but also uh, it enables a lot of interesting use cases that we will talk about a little bit later. Uh, yeah, and I have actually something to add uh, here. So uh, you raised a really good point uh, with why people want, like, to change things from 2.0 to 3.0 and uh, uh, so the, the kind of the, mo the easiest way to explain it is uh, the following so uh, most of the big tech companies uh, uh, they benefit from your data so the value of the, the, those companies uh, like 90 percent of that consists of your data and so the natural question is then so since it's our data so why do they benefit from it why shouldn't we be benefiting from from it so that's probably the, the biggest concern i see uh so one thing that i want to clarify here though is th the way you described it makes it sound like you know the the, the advantage to the user is clear but what is the advantage to the to the company? Like, isn't it more beneficial for the company to keep things on their premises versus allowing you to own your identity? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. So if we kind of uh, uh, oppose uh, the current uh, uh, po um, economical structure, then it is definitely, uh, uh, beneficial for companies to keep things as they are right now. Uh, but look at uh, what's happening with uh, uh, the biggest uh, names in the crypto space, uh, with like biggest projects. So for example, the Uniswap. Uh, so the capitalization of those projects grows in much, much faster than the capitalization of any other company in the world. Uh, so 
and uh, well, I don't have the exact number right now, unfortunately, but uh, uh, the, the, like the biggest uh, uh, benefit for projects like that is that they absorb uh, funds much, much faster. So whoever starts those, they have much more power than the centralized companies. Hope that explains. I thought maybe I wanted to talk a little bit about Bitcoin itself and because I think Bitcoin really popularized this movement of like, let's make things decentralized. Let's take the power away from the centralized institutions. Um, so I'll just go ahead. So I did write this article in 2017 that talks about Bitcoin. I know that things have changed a lot. So Ash, like, keep me humble. Tell me where I might be saying things that are true for Bitcoin, but not true for the overall state. Um, but so in about, I think, 2008, 2009, this paper came out that was titled Bitcoin, a peer to peer electronic um, cash system. And it was published by somebody named Satoshi Nakamoto. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? No one really knows. I think people have ideas, but that'll be, you know, that's something for another podcast or another talk. Um, so this paper talked about this new system called Bitcoin, which would allow payments online to be sent directly from one party to another. So I could send Bitcoin to Ash um, without having to go through a financial institution. And that's exciting because commerce over the internet traditionally relies on financial is institutions to be that trusted third party. And that's what we hate because we're putting so much power into the hands of these institutions. They're taking a cut of the payment and we're essentially trusting them to, I guess, do good by us, the consumers, the people who are actually using the product. Um, and the whole idea of Bitcoin, from my understanding, is that the idea is what if we use some sort of math puzzle, um, a cryptographic proof instead of trust to form that backbone of the, the electronic payment system? So it's sort of like instead of trusting Goldman Sachs to do good for us, why don't we just use math? And I really like that because it's it's automated. It feels like it's scalable. It seems to make sense. And, you know, if we can do it ourselves, why give the power to those third party institutions? So, yeah, my argument is that Bitcoin is this movement of decentralized, I guess, commerce on the Internet and also popularize the blockchain. So curious about what you guys think. Um, so, yeah, I have uh, my own opinion about that uh, as for, you know, uh, uh, decentralization and uh, taking the power of the authorities. So I don't I don't really believe in that, uh, it, although I, I think about myself as, you know, crypto enthusiast, but uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, Things change just because uh, uh, people want to take more uh, uh, take more authority into their hands. Uh, I believe in the user experience, though. So I believe that systems like uh, Bitcoin, like Ethereum, like every other uh, um, you know um, project in the crypto world at the moment. Uh, they provide much better user experience to whatever they do compared to the traditional finance. Uh, so traditional finance, well, if we talk about finance, but we don't have to just, uh, 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 you know, use that. It's just an example. So the DeFi is one of the most well-developed ecosystem, and uh, uh, I use it as an example. Uh, so we have and lots DeFi of DeFi stands for decentralized, decentralized finance, right? Yeah, de okay. decentralized finance. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> so uh, just to explain your point about uh, uh, taking the power from the authorities. Uh, so we still have lots of ru rudimentary uh, uh, things, uh, uh, such as, well, let's say, uh, why should we clear uh, uh, like uh, stock exchange transactions in two days? Why couldn't there be 24-7 uh, trading on stock exchanges? Well, that happens because the uh, uh, our world was built that way, right? And now uh, nobody wants to kind of question that architecture, right? So, and with systems like Bitcoin and blockchain, 
we actually have have a chance to uh, question those uh, like rudimentary systems and introduce a much better user experience uh, that uh, basically turns the customers from the TradFi to the DeFi and uh, uh, that turns basically people to uh, the blockchain ecosystem. That makes sense. I like thinking about it from the perspective of um, I'm getting distracted by Amir's cute dog. <laughs> I like thinking about it from the perspective of the user experience and that makes sense. And um, another example would be like cash remittances. So if you want to send money, I mean, the sending money to um, Ukraine is also an example of this, but yeah, like let's say there are people working overseas and they want to send money back home. You can do that instantly using some blockchain application rather than having to wait three to five days for the bank to process it. And that's really cool. That's a good user experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that that's exactly the case. And uh, uh, there are more and more services popping up every day on blockchain that allow you to do things that were not even possible uh, in, you know, uh, traditional non-blockchain world. We can talk about them, but let's do it later. <laughs> um, I, I do I do have a few questions. Like I was listening to what, what you were talking about, but one of the things that I always struggle with is, you know, as, as Serena was talking about you know, before or currently, uh, you know, there are central governance systems that tell you how to run stuff. And, you know, part of that is, you know, when we're talking about finance, you know, a significant part of that is the business logic, right? So essentially, this is how you loan money to people so that you make money and this whole economic system would work, blah, blah, blah. And now we are abstracting all of that into math. You know, we, we have created these smart contracts. So what's, what's the guarantee? You know, business logic is partly... You know, actual logic. You know, somebody has thought about it and theorized it. Blah, blah blah. Part of it is always gut feeling. You know, because nothing is always completely objective. But you know, you know, how does the smart contracts interact with business logic? You know, are they essentially a replacement of business logic? And you know, and or, of course, business logic over time changes, right? Because the market changes, the you know, the offering changes. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So how 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 do these things interact with each other? Um, so I would to answer this question, I would limit it to uh, Bitcoin for now because it's uh, uh, a bit simpler than you know explaining that on smart contracts. Uh, so what happens with uh, Bitcoin is essentially the following. So Serena pointed out uh, uh, very correctly that. Uh, uh, what it enables you to do is to send money from point A to point B, right? Uh, so what would happen in the traditional world is you would basically have an intermediary right here, a bank, uh, and you send the instruction, hey, bank, take X amount of money from my account, put it on the on Bob's account, right? Uh, and well, the bank would just execute that transaction. So nothing would really change instead of a few records uh, in uh, the bank you know, ledger. So now what happens with Bitcoin is we don't have the bank anymore, right? So somebody has to keep the ledger. So the ledger is actually distributed among other participants of the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem. And uh, uh, in Bitcoin, there are two roles. So the first role is the node. The second role is the miner. So the node and well, miner usually consists of those, of those two because you need the nodes to run a miner. Uh, so what happens is nodes keep track of all the requests, of all the instructions from me asking to send X amount of money to Bob. Uh, and uh, uh, they just keep track of all these transactions and uh, uh, everyone keeps uh, uh, this ledger in you know the same 
kind of form. So uh, everyone should have the same records and they always kind of uh, uh, connect with each other just to make sure that this is true. Um, what happens with miners is they take one of, uh, they take a bunch of transactions such as mine, for example, and they create uh, a block out of it. So what it means is basically they confirm my transaction. So they say, hey, nodes, please include this transaction into the overall blockchain. Uh, and for doing that, miners get uh, rewards in the form of Bitcoins. So that's how the system works uh, right now. Um, it's not the most you know, efficient way to implement it, but uh, uh, you know, in 2009, uh, we didn't have anything. And suddenly uh, now we have this uh, infrastructure and ecosystem that allows you to send uh, money from point A to point B verifiably. So, which is really cool. It is pretty cool. Yeah. So to summarize, um, mining for Bitcoin, it's a process to, not a process necessarily to really issue new currency. It's a process to verify transactions, um, obtain that decentralized network-wide consensus of the current state of the blockchain and miners get Bitcoin as a incentive to validate those transactions and I guess a fun fact I think in 2009 when Bitcoin first came about I think you got 50 Bitcoin um what to create a new when you created a new block now it's something like 6.25 Bitcoin um so things have really decreased and I used to mine some Bitcoin um back in I All think right. 2016 yeah I, I probably shouldn't have done this but I like hooked up my computer at um in my office in grad school and I just had it mining and I didn't make very much, but it was better than nothing. Um, so what Bitcoin did, I think that's called proof of work, right? And exactly, in recent yeah. years, I remember hearing things about Ethereum moving to proof of stake. And that was sort of at a time when I dropped off and didn't study cryptocurrency anymore. So yeah, what is how are all these other cryptocurrencies and the cryptocurrencies that form the backbone of um, DeFi, De decentralized finance. What yeah. are they using proof of work or proof of stake or what are they doing? Like, how does mining work there? So today, most of uh, you know what is called so Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, same as for example Polkadot or Solana, we call them layer one blockchains. So they they become an infrastructure for you know every other possible decentralized apps. So we call them layer one. So though. Uh, nowadays, most of them, I mean, the biggest ones, uh, uh, they uh, uh, use proof of stake as their consensus mechanism. Um, and there is a reason for that. So with Bitcoin, for example, um, so when I just started in 2016, uh, I uh, what I was doing is I was working for a crypto mining equipment manufacturer uh in ukraine and uh, we were building those asset so those machines that uh, mine bitcoin that confirm transactions and get a reward in the form of bitcoin for that so and first of all oh man they're noisy and they take a lot of power uh and so what happens right now is uh it's an industry on itself right now and it consumes ridiculous amount of uh, power. So um, one crypto mining facility might easily be 100 megawatts. So just to explain what 100 megawatts is, is 100,000 teapots, uh, right? And uh, um, it consumes r ridiculous amount of power. That's why uh, 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 since, uh, uh, since Ethereum, uh, people started thinking about, uh, uh, how can we change that? How we can introduce some other ways of, uh, 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 uh building the consensus mechanism on blockchain. And, uh, um, 
that's basically how proof of stake uh, uh, appeared uh, in, in in the ecosystem. So what proof of stake is? Uh, so th the the most simple way to explain it is uh, the following. So in order to confirm transactions in the proof of work, uh, you need a miner, right? So miner costs let's say uh, one thousand uh, Canadian. So uh, in the proof of stake world, instead of owning the miner, you actually own the cryptocurrency of that blockchain and you just stake it. So you say, uh, hey, cryptocurrency, uh, I'm putting my own funds uh, to confirm transactions uh, on your blockchain. And if I act maliciously, I allow you to slash me. So instead of owning the physical infrastructure, you now own a digital asset that represents your stake on that blockchain and that allows you to validate, confirm transactions on it uh, and uh, that punishes you in case you do something wrong. So that's the difference between proof of work and proof of stake. Um, yeah. Do you have a feeling of which one is better? Is it possible to, to define better in this sense? So I would say it's a historical, uh, it's, it's just uh, how the history goes. So you start with uh, MVP, right? Uh, we, we all know how startups work. So you start with something dummy, uh, but something that actually works. So that was Bitcoin because suddenly you were able to send uh, funds from point A to point B. And now we start, uh, started uh, uh, experiencing the limitations of this system. And proof of work is just one of those limitations. So it's not OK uh, burning uh, fossil fuels uh, to kind of confirm the, uh, to, to, to secure the network, right? To secure the blockchain network. Uh, you should, in, in the digital world, you should come up with some more elegant way of doing that. And uh, well, I definitely prefer proof of stake over proof of work. Uh, the only problem with uh, uh, proof of stake is uh, it's really hard to make sure that uh, uh, nobody owns uh, a, a critical stake in your system, right? So that's why uh, you should kind of make sure you distribute your tokens and allocate them properly. So, and uh, there is a whole science to that in the crypto space. But, uh, uh, you know, as I said, uh, major biggest projects, uh, they go that direction right now. And uh, uh, I think it's a good, good sign. Yeah, so to summarize, um, we were talking about Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain having transactions that get validated. Um, there's different ways of doing this validation. With Bitcoin, it's proof of work. With other cryptocurrencies, it's proof of stake. And where do, where do smart contracts come in? Um, is it like smart con So with the Bitcoin blockchain, we are validating transactions with other blockchains. Are we validating that smart contracts have been exchanged between party A and party B? Uh, well, actually, we gave a pretty good, you know, overview of everything that we just discussed in, in, in the recipe. And the smart contracts is uh, one of the uh, points uh, there. Because, well, I understand that it might be a little bit overwhelming starting high level as Web3 down to um, uh, down to uh, what we are discussing right now. But yeah, essentially, uh, smart contracts is, uh, think about them as following. So again, let's start with something we already know, right? We know Bitcoin at this point. So uh, in Bitcoin, the only type of transaction that is possible is transferring funds. So it's essentially uh, a command where you say, hey, here is point A, which is me. Here is point B, which is you. I want to send X amount. Go. Very simple script. Uh, so what we call smart contracts is essentially the same kind of uh, 
script, but that is Turing complete now. So imagine you put, you know, C++ into blockchain and uh, uh, suddenly you can now describe any event in the world in, in, in the form of code uh, within the blockchain. So that's kind of the uh, change from the developer standpoint. So now you can you know express anything in, in that smart contract. Um, do you guys, is, is that a good explanation? <laughs> It sounds super cool. I think I'm going to have to check out the recipe, though, to learn more. Uh, yeah, you should definitely check it out. Uh, so we, I think, uh, uh, so we, we have the recipe for this talk, and it includes uh, a recipe from our project, from ML and Blockchain. Uh, and uh, Amir, do you want to talk about the, the rest of the things that are out, that are there? Yeah, just very quickly, uh, yeah, the the... The screen that I'm showing, you have the link to it in the YouTube show description. Uh, so you can click on it and see the same thing that I'm showing here. Uh, a lot of the, you know, this is one of the things that we are doing for this show that when we are researching for what we want to talk about, uh, essentially we keep track of everything we find so that you can also go deeper in those. Uh, for example, you know, this article that uh, Ash found He's going to add a few more notes to it so that you know how to use it. Uh, but you know, uh, you can see, you can rewatch this video, and these are you know the high level topics we're talking about on it, and a few other things like you know there are currently around eight, yep, yeah, exactly eight uh, resources that we found, and we probably add a few more things to it, uh, including uh, the, the project that Ash led in our community, and we will talk about it a little more uh, about using. Uh, essentially machine learning on uh, on blockchain. By the way, Amir, the reason why I didn't put the notes uh, is because I was using your uh, uh, extension. And uh, well, I, to be honest with you, uh, I didn't uh, know that it is possible to uh, take notes from the, uh, within the extension. But uh, you tell me if it is possible. It is. So okay. Essentially, whatever you find, you essentially click on the extension and very easily take all your notes here. And you can even, uh, you know, format it using markup. So you can you can take notes wherever you're finding resources that are helpful. Anyway, enough of this. Uh, back to the topic of uh, the topic at hand. I guess one thing that was interesting for me uh, when I was looking at these resources was, uh, you know, going back to what I asked, you know, essentially going from business logic to uh, to to smart contracts and replacing them essentially. And I think you know what you said was that you know Bitcoin was was a fairly simple business logic. So replacing it with a smart contract was pretty straightforward. And you know the conversation that followed that sort of told me that you know we're moving from as you said, like MVP versions of how blockchain technology can be used to more complicated versions. Uh, and I know, you know, eventually uh, we will talk a little about, you know, more uh, sophisticated use cases where, uh, you know, we you, you're using it for more complex financial transactions like loan and credit scoring and such. Uh, but one thing that I've been seeing and, you know, towards the very end, I'm very interested to also talk about how this can enable creator economy, like the application that, uh, you know, Serena is creating or the application that we're building. Like all of these can, in principle, like the business logic is more complex. Yeah. But, you know, what you're saying is that you're, you have a trend towards enabling all of those kind of use cases as well with more probably complicated the smart contracts and or different types of proofs that we need. Uh, well, one of the things that is very interesting and i believe it is related to how smart contracts are, are set up is nft so every day i go to twitter again and i see another board ape that somebody is excited about having purchased it and i don't get it tell me what am i missing <laughs> yeah so the, the, i like how, how you started it so uh you you nailed it in the hat so smart contracts enabled all these different uh, applications to pop up. So that's what 
I was uh, calling like a better user experience. So now using smart contracts as an infrastructure, we suddenly can do lots and lots of things. And NFT is one of them. So what NFT is essentially is, so think about uh, the situation when where you're a digital creator. So, and you just created an awesome video and you want to start selling this, this video, right? So uh, where do you go to do that? Uh, so you can post it on YouTube, but then suddenly everyone has access to it. And uh, well, uh, I mean, you can uh, set up Patreon and, but then you don't really sell that particular piece uh, of art, right? Uh, so what you can do instead is, uh, you can go on forums and try to sell it there. But again, whoever owns it can sell it again because, uh, well, they just have a copy of that video and uh, uh, they can do whatever with that copy, right? So, and that's the biggest problem with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with digital art. So uh, in Web 2.0 uh, 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 ecosystem, it's replicable. So you just make thousands of copies, send them to whoever you want, and nobody really owns that digital asset. So NFTs are there to change it. So NFT connects your digital assets to a blockchain. So suddenly you can verifiably prove that you are the owner of this asset and whenever you want to transfer it to someone that person now also can uh, uh, verify to the rest of the world then that they're owners of that asset uh, so just an example from you know my personal life so uh, march 8th the international women's day is a big thing back home and uh, we usually uh, present something to our close ones to uh, kind of uh, women around us. So uh, I'm a uh, I'm a married person, and uh, uh, last year I came up with a gift of NFT. So I found an NFT that uh, relates to the topic of the International Women's Day. There are like a lot of women on the, on, on that NFT, and you know it's it like the 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 the, the vibe of this NFT was really cool. So what I did. I just purchased it on uh, Nifty ga Gateway. I created a wallet for my wife and I just transferred it there. So now she owns an NFT. So that's how it works. I, and, hope, uh, I, hope, and, my, I hope my boyfriend is watching this so he can do the same <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, to be perfectly honest, uh, it, it actually the, the price for that NFT dropped a little bit uh, since the moment I bought it, but I mean, that was a gift and uh, there is much more to this gift than just the price. So uh, there was the whole idea behind it. But anyway, it's bringing sappiness to the 21st century. Okay. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> and actually, NFTs facilitate not only the digital art. So um, uh, you can think about, you know, contracts as NFTs. Uh, you can think about your digital identity as being an NFT. And, uh, uh, well, actually what we do as a project can be introduced as an NFT going forward. So think about your uh, credit score, right? So uh, it is now owned by TransUnion or Equifax or, you know, those big banks. Uh, instead of that, you, you could have an NFT representing your credit score so it is a smart contract that automatically calculates uh your personal credit score your reputation in the ecosystem and puts it out there for you and you're still an owner of you know this piece of information so it's a really broad uh, the nft has a really broad uh, application space so but but yeah obviously right now uh since you know people are a little bit greedy, to be honest. And uh, uh, so everything gets hyped pretty easily. And uh, that's when we start having those things like board apes and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but but yeah, the application is certainly there and it allows a lot of interesting things to happen. 
Yeah, and a thing I don't quite understand, and this makes me sound like a boomer perhaps, with NFTs. So yeah, if you you let's say you get a crypto punk and you put that as your Twitter profile, which people seem to be doing nowadays, what's stopping me from copying and right click and I just download it and I say, I've got this now myself. Is the the key here that you can actually go to the whatever blockchain it is and say, Serena does not own this crypto punk, it's actually wallet like A15ZX hash, whatever. Yeah, like so what's the magic behind an NFT really? So the situation that you explain is true today, right? But uh, imagine a situation where uh, anytime you put something uh, on your avatar, you'd have to prove that you actually own uh, that piece of digital asset. So what happens now is, uh, well, obviously corporate uh, companies, they, they do not do that, uh, but some do, but uh, it, whenever you need a, a image to put on your blog post or anything, you just go on the internet, you download it from Google and you put it on, that's it. Uh, so I imagine a world where the infrastructure itself wouldn't allow you to do that. So if, we, if we're talking about uh, uh, social media, uh, I can imagine a situation where Facebook would, at some point, would say, will say, hey, I need the proof from you that you actually own this digital asset and you can uh, put it on your uh, social media. So it might be, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, it kind of limits the, uh, digital, uh, the, the customer experience. So it might be uh, implicit. So uh, user doesn't even have to see that, but I can imagine a situation like that happening in like 10 years or so, where we would have yeah, to prove and, that we actually own something on, 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 the, on the internet. Yeah, that makes sense. An example and clarification of this that I heard from Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, who talks lots about NFTs. He said, think about the blue check mark on Instagram or TikTok showing that you're a verified creator. I can't just go around and say friendly veg is verified. I have to actually get that, or it has to be like Instagram would prove that I can have that check mark associated with just my account and with no one else. So you're saying yeah. a central system is needed to verify? I'm kidding. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess the answer to my own question is that there's a smart contract that will handle those things rather than a person. So I assume the even the verified thing on Twitter is largely algorithmic. I, I highly doubt that there is a person sitting somewhere being like, hmm, you look legit. You get a blue mark. Yeah. Right, so. <laughs> um, All right. So, so I. I needed some time to open it up on my uh, uh, phone, but mm. here it is. Oh, I see. That's the so, women. Yeah. They... Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's called the slime swing. It's a reproduction of uh, uh, Renaissance uh, 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 painting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that were, that's the kind of the idea behind it. So that. Yeah. Uh, uh, that the Renaissance painting was also like very, you know, like, uh, <laughs> at atmospheric, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I want to pivot the conversation a little towards something that has been, I know we wanted to talk about examples of DeFi, but this conversation is, is very interesting on foundational level, right? So th there is John MBA in the chat that is asking about, you know, with different variations of, uh, you know, proof of work, proof of stake, etc. You know, you're, you're probably attracting and you know appealing to a different type of audience. So that that's a that's a very interesting question to talk about. But I want to take it one step further. So, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time in the past few years. You know, as we've been building aggregate intellect, thinking about the value of intellectual property. You know, you talked about the value of. Uh, the value of digital art, right? Uh, but you know, another very good example where uh, NFTs and 
Web 3.0 can can uh, produce a lot of values, creator economy. Uh, and you know the the biggest question on my mind in the past few years, you know, as as I've been reading theories of work around it, is you know how do you how do you assign value, you know beyond you know what the market assigns value to to things. So you know when when you take a step back and think about salaried work, right? So somebody is doing some amount of work for a company or a product or whatever, and they get a certain number of dollars in return. That's essentially sort of like proof of work, like. You showed up between these hours and these hours, therefore we are going to give you. And that's completely detached from how much value that has created, right? So regardless yeah. of I did this thing and therefore it resulted in this much business value, therefore I should get, right? And, and there are good reasons that people do it. And as you said, that's one of the simplest types of contracts that we can have. And now you're talking about proof of stake, you know, which is an improvement on top of that, probably closer to sort of an equity-based company. Uh, you know, compensation. But w a question that I always have when I hear conversations about Web 3.0 is, you know, ultimately the most valuable thing is proof of value, right? So sort of like what happens in a startups, right? So I sell the equity of a company to an investor. So they are, uh, you know, essentially stakeholders in the upside of the value that this company will have in the future. So is that something like that going on here? Like is, is proof of stake a step towards that direction? Or am I not thinking about it correctly? Um, well, I'd say we should probably uh, separate one from another because uh, uh, what you're talking about uh, as, uh, you know, creating a value, it's, uh, uh, it happens. So I would, I would separate the uh, execution layer from the business logic layer, right? So the execution layer is the infrastructure that we, we're using, right? And we need certain types of mechanisms uh, to um, uh, allow any all those like different transactions to happen. So the proof of stake is essentially that consensus mechanism that allows you uh, to facilitate the transactions, right? Uh, on the business logic side, where the value is actually created, uh, so it's uh, so the, the, there are like so the reason why DeFi first appeared on blockchain is just because of that, because uh, one of the key components uh, of the current uh, uh, economies uh, is the timely uh, verif uh, is, is an ability to timely verifiably and securely uh, tell the market value of certain digital of certain assets right and that's why DeFi is here so we need an infrastructure of decentralized exchanges to be able to tell uh, the price of digital assets at a given point of time so I hope that kind of separates one from another and explains uh, how the value, uh, so, so separates the proof of the, the consensus mechanisms from the actual value creation. So the consensus mechanism enables you to create value out of decentralized apps. Uh, and I, yeah, I think it's a perfect segue to talk about DeFi now because, well, uh, that's kind of the next step after, you know. And perhaps uh, use of machine learning as well. Uh, oh, yeah. You, oh, you yeah. promised to do that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have not yet delivered on our promise. And I'm super yeah. curious how we could actually use machine learning. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'd be happy to tell about it because that's one of the things that I spent so much time uh, recently, like uh, last year. Um, uh, uh, sure. So yeah, basically what happens is uh, uh, since we need a, an efficient mechanism to tell the value of the digital assets that are, that are out there on blockchain. So uh, we started, uh, uh, the, the, there is this term that uh, popped up, D DeFi, decentralized finance. So uh, how, uh, 
so the price, the uh, how price discovery worked before decentralized uh, uh, finance. So we would have uh, an ecosystem of you know traditional exchanges, but those are well traditional cryptocurrency exchanges, centralized systems that allowed you to exchange funds, right? So we have a bunch of those, Kraken, Bitfinance. Uh, uh, I think there are five or 1,000 of them right now. So, uh, and uh, we heard a lot of, you know, uh, fraudulent ones uh, such as MT Gox uh, uh, and uh, Quadriga and, uh, well, that's the, so there, the reason for those kind of frauds uh, uh, were possible is because, first of all, uh, those were centralized entities uh, uh, who could just, you know, go away with your money. So that's how we worked before. I mean, there are still traditional exchanges out there right now, but we're moving from there to the decentralized world. So now we have decentralized applications. Uh, serving the same kind of uh, functions that uh, we used uh, traditional exchanges for. So now we have uh, similar exchanges uh, like Uniswap, like SushiSwap and OneInch. Uh, that's just one of uh, uh, one type of decentralized apps. We also have uh, uh, decentralized apps that facilitate derivative trading. Uh, we have decentralized apps that serve as uh, uh, asset managers. So they move digital assets uh, uh, across the ecosystem. And we call all this world, oh yeah, I forgot about lending and borrowing, something that we do. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we call this whole world decentralized finance because suddenly we need an efficient mechanism to... Uh, tell us the price of the assets that we have on blockchain right now, right? We need efficient price discovery mechanisms. So, and just because of that, all the rest of components such as loans and, you know, derivatives are needed also uh, to facilitate the price discovery. So what we do is basically our, 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 uh, thesis starts with uh, uh, lending and borrowing, right? So uh, we started looking at a couple of projects uh, uh, on blockchain, such as Aave and Compound. And we started looking at how they uh, work from the inside, right? And uh, what it allows them to, um, uh, to serve some functions to blockchain. So uh, basically, Right now, Amir and Serena, you both can just go on blockchain and uh, uh, get a loan. But the problem with that loan is going to be that you would have to uh, put in 150% collateral. Uh, and that almost doesn't make sense, but it yeah. does. So uh, the reason why it is like that is because, well, there is no way to kind of uh, make sure that you pay your loan back other than just... Uh, uh, having the same amount sitting uh, uh, on, the, you know, on the smart contract. Yeah. So and that's a big issue. So the reason why it happens like that is because we don't have reputation in the trustless environment. So we basically need to introduce trust to a trustless environment, which is blockchain. And that's something, that's the kind of the problem that we're trying to solve, right? Uh, the way you introduce trust in the traditional finance, uh, it's the credit score that serves that kind of purpose. Uh, in the blockchain uh, world, there is no credit score at all. So whenever you get a loan from uh, a lending or borrowing um, smart contract, they don't ask you who you are. They just tell you, hey, give us 150% worth of uh, 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 you so let's say you want to you want to get a uh, hundred dollars loan right they tell you hey put in 150 dollars worth of bitcoins and we'll give you hundred dollars uh, uh, and in USDT which is a stable coin uh, 
you may ask, so I foresee the question, because <laughs> uh, that's the most usual question that I always get. So what's the point? What's the point of you know putting in 150% uh, dollar worth of Bitcoins and getting just 100 USDT? Well, you increase your leverage. That's the easiest way to understand it. So let's say you have those 150 uh, Bitcoins, but you now also want to have exposure to Ethereum. So you go to uh, Aave, you put in your Bitcoins as a collateral, you get USDT and you buy Ethereum. So now you have uh, exposure to cryptocurrency than you had before. So it works for you when the cryptocurrency goes up, it doesn't work for you when it goes down because if the value of your collateral goes below certain value, you will be liquidated. So you will no longer have yeah. access to your uh, collateral. So yeah, that's basically uh, one of the most crucial components in our you know current world, which is lending and borrowing and credit in general. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, we think we take credit for granted because we all we, we can just go and you know buy a house, get a mortgage, uh, get a car uh, for credit money. Uh, so even when I when I was a kid, uh, we didn't have a, a credit score in Ukraine, and there are still lots of countries out there uh, where people don't even have access to credit. So not to say credit score. So blockchain is there to solve exactly those kind of issues because it's really hard to build credit, to, to introduce credit in countries where there is no established banking infrastructure and uh, where it is hard to kind of imagine this kind of infrastructure to show uh, to, to to be introduced in the nearest future. So that's why we can do it with blockchain. Interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we are way over time, um, and we didn't even get to talk about machine learning. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we we have to probably do this again. But uh, I usually ask for your verdict at the end of the session. So what what's your call to action for people? What should they look at maybe each of you can do a 30 second verdict and call to action and maybe you can include uh invite how people can join your project uh ash uh in your call to action as well uh yeah absolutely so my call to action would be just go and uh, check out what uh, we created on the aggregate intellect uh, uh notion community page uh because uh, we describe everything in quite a lot of details. And, you know, we have a recipe, we have article on Medium. So you will have access to all that through our community page. So definitely go and check it out. Uh, uh, and well, the purpose of that, uh, you know, page is to explain how you can use your machine learning skills uh, to build something really good on blockchain. Um, yeah, so go we check it out. Adding that link to the recipe as well so that people can check it out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Awesome. Serena. Yeah, so my call to action is also check out that recipe. I'm going to be following my own call to action and checking out the recipe. In terms of my verdict, I'm still not quite clear on how I could apply blockchain to my um, vegan recipe app. It does seem like this is the direction that the industry in a sense is going i feel like i will be behind if i don't get on it now and try to actually understand the importance but at this point i'm a bit unsure <laughs> yes what about you amir yeah i mean uh i'm going to read the recipe as well uh <laughs> i think there there is a lot to learn uh I, I i was very interested to talk about uh you know decentralized autonomous organizations and how you know, those uh, can create creator economies. Uh, this is a very, very interesting topic and very related to, uh, you know, where I was going with the whole proof of value thing. Uh, so we'll, we'll and, and John in the chat is asking for a session number two, which I think is happening in most of our uh, sessions. But unfortunately, you're out of time, way over time, actually. 
uh, and we will be back, promise, uh, to continue this conversation. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you check the recipe, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. everyone. All right, bye. Yeah, we definitely should do uh, version two or round two.